everyone. I'm very glad to see you all. Um, today we are very happy to have uh, Laura Denai, who's going to tell us about a Caronian perspective on celestial philosophy. So Laura, take it away. Thank you very much, Felipe. Uh, let me start by thanking uh, you guys for uh, inviting to speak, especially uh, Charles and Felipe. Thanks a lot. It's great to be uh, here virtually uh, at your high energy seminar. So um, I will welcome any sort of interruptions and questions. Uh, let's try to keep it um, interactive as, as much as possible. I'm not used to give a Zoom talks anymore, so I hope uh, uh, that will be OK. So uh, yeah, we'll be talking about recent work um, done in collaboration with uh, Adrien Fiorucci, who is a postdoc here at the Technical University of Vienna, uh, Yannick Erfrey, who is a postdoc in University of Mons in Belgium, and Romain Rudiconi, also a postdoc at Théovin. So the, the main motivation for our work was uh, to address this uh, outstanding question of having a holographic uh, description of quantum gravity for space-time which are not anti-decider, but instead asymptotically flat space-times. So here I depicted the usual Penrose diagram of, uh, of a flat space-time where a massless particle follow these null geodesics and reach this boundary of flat space, which is called future null infinity denoted by scry plus. And similarly, there is a past boundary, which is uh, scry minus. So my motivation will be very short because I think that um, uh, we, we don't think that the holographic principle is just a curiosity of anti serial space time, but that instead is a very supposed to be a fundamental uh, principle of quantum gravity. And we should address uh, how this extends to more realistic space time, such as assembly of that space time, which I recall is not exactly the universe we live in. We live in the serial space, but is an excellent approximation for most uh, physical purposes from collider physics to astrophysical uh, to scales, which are smaller than cosmological scales. So uh, I will dive directly into the topic because I know some of you guys are also experts and don't want to waste so much time, but if you have questions on the motivation and general picture, uh, just, just let me know. So the first, the thing I would want to insist uh, here today is what is the natural boundary when, then we should look at when we want to formulate um, this holographic uh, picture. And there are two natural or two proposals that have emerged in the recent literature. Um, the first one is to simply look at this uh, null boundary, which is a three-dimensional hypersurface, this null infinity. Um, and by looking at this, this would be the holographic screen that we will land on a sort of co-dimension one a type of holography where the dual theory should have the symmetries of flat space time, which I will recall in the in introduction, uh, are the so-called bondi mesner zak as uh, symmetries. So we should uh, have some theory which is invariant under, which is a sort of a BMS field theory in 3D. And this was the, uh, the prime attempts to formulate holographic for flat space time were uh, focused on this approach. Now, in the recent years, there have been this nice uh, celestial holography program that has emerged uh, thanks to the works of uh, Strominger and collaborators, which instead uh, proposes that to formulate a dual theory called a two dimensional celestial conformal field theory as the holographic dual of a 40 bulk. So this uh, theory is formulated on the celestial sphere, which is a Euclidean uh, two sphere at the boundary. So null infinity is a real line times a two sphere. And this two sphere is the celestial sphere is really this, this sphere that you, you see when you look uh, at the night sky. So there are two sort of uh, proposal for that. And they, are, they both have somehow advantages and disadvantages. So in the first picture, um, it's, it's a bit more like ADS-CFT in the sense that it's co-dimension one type holography. Sometimes people are confused here on the right hand side because they say, okay, this is 2D, 4D duality. So this sounds weird. Um, um, 
But uh, the problem with the first approach, and I will come back to that, is that to come up with the, with the holographic description, you need to be able to uh, deal with the so-called fluxes of radiation, which is escaping through the null boundary of that space-time, some, something that usually we, we do not encounter in ADS, because we impose some reflective kind of boundary condition at the, at the boundary. Um, so that's why this celestial picture is very nice, because it avoids this problem and it really makes a uh, full advantage of the powerful uh, CFT language and techniques that we already know and love from ADS CFT. So this is why uh, people have been focusing uh, lately on this, on this uh, paradigm. But now, as we will see of what people are often um, wondering about is what happens to the extra dimension? What is the role of translation in this picture? So it's indeed the price to pay to work in the celestial sphere is that the role of translation is obscure, as you will see, it implies a shift in the conformal dimension of the objects on the celestial sphere. So what I want to um, promote in this talk is somehow on the, on the first hand to revisit strongly this, this first perspective by, um, by basically arguing uh, that there is a way to, to, treat, uh, to treat correctly these fluxes, and then once that to propose that the, the theory dual is a three-dimensional specific uh, conformal, what I would call a conformal Kaolian field theory, which is coupled to external sources. And the second goal of this talk will be to tell you uh, that actually these, not, uh, these two approaches are not irreconcilable, but instead there is a natural uh, map and we can actually relate these two approach and maybe that's a, that's a nice thing to do rather than focusing on one or the other, that there are two equivalent and related approaches to the problem. So that's what I want to tell you. So to, to start discussing that, I will have to introduce, I'm, I know some, there are some experts uh, here in this group on, uh, on that, but I want to uh, briefly recall what are these symmetries of the boundary of flat space time in a very rapid way. Um, then I will tell you about uh, celestial holography and celestial CFT. I will uh, focus mostly on the so-called conformally soft sector. Uh, and then we will, I will discuss uh, this uh, new conformal uh, Kaolian theory coupled with external sources and show you how the wild identities of this theory can reproduce the one in celestial CFT. Okay, so let's, let's, let's start. So um, I will uh, recall for those who don't, don't know that the symmetries of asymptotically flat space time are extremely rich and they are this so-called uh, bondi mesner zacks uh, symmetry. So this is um, a definition or an, a metric ansatz for what uh, people call asymptotically flat. So um, in, this, in this setup, we are labeling, we're using this uh, convenient bond, so-called bondi coordinates where there is a retarded time, uh, which are followed by null rays and radial coordinates and two angles on, on the sphere, Z and Z bar. This first line is just exactly Minkowski uh, written in these coordinates. And there are some subleading corrections. So they are one of our R expansions as one approaches the boundary when R goes to infinity. And this is a very good answer to work with. Of course, uh, there are ways to generalize and discuss to which extent this answer is the most generic. There are some gauge fixing here. Um, if you have questions, uh, just, just let me know. Um, but, but I will focus on this answer. So these are my notations. And you, you can see that there are two quantities here in blue. So these are the so-called bonding mass and angular momentum aspect, M and N. You, so you, this is uh, this is NZ, but there is also NZ bar, which is encoded in these complex co conjugate terms here. And a Einstein's equation impose um, some constraint equations on this quantity, namely their evolution is dictated by these two equations. So the explicit form is not very important. But um, these functions are constrained to obey these uh, evolution equations. 
And now in red, we have this uh, very important quantity, which is the so-called asymptotic shear of null Jodorowsky with congruence, or sometimes called the gravitational uh, data. So these encodes, this CAB uh, tensor encodes the two polarization modes of the, of the graviton. And this tensor here called NAB, so not to be confused with NA here is, is this quantity is defined as the retarded time derivative of the gravitational shear. And it encodes very importantly, the uh, gravitation, gravitational wave uh, um, escaping the boundary, escaping uh, null infinity. And this was the motivation uh, to study uh, these metrics. At that time in the 60s, the, the status of, of um, uh, gravitational wave was not clear, was not uh, clear whether it was an artifact of of uh, Einstein theory of, the, of these uh, or whether radiation was a physical uh, process. And, and basically what uh, these gentlemen, Bondi and company showed was that they prove uh, the existence of gravitational wave at a nonlinear level. And so these, these kind of metric are very important and very realistic to describe any kind of isolated system. So if you have, for instance, a black hole merger that is happening here somewhere in the space time, if you look very far away, you are here at LIGO at null infinity with the detector, you will collect a gravitational wave um, and, um, uh, and it will turn on your detector and you will uh, collect this via this news, news tensor. Is there any question on, on that? I'm going a bit fast because uh, I know that there are some uh, experts and, but basically I'm just describing a metric in 4D, which is flat as one uh, is observing from very far away. So um, now the very nice uh, thing that people are, are now excited about is, uh, is this infinite dimensional symmetries called the Bondi uh, mesner zacks or BMS symmetries, where it was shown that there were actually infinitely uh, many more symmetries than the one in flat space times. So naively you might expect that the symmetry preserved in assembly flat space time will be just given by the Poincaré transformations for translation and six Lorentz uh, transformations. But in fact, uh, it's uh, the BMS group. So this, the symmetries which, which preserve this sort of expansion are uh, infinitely uh, way uh, more, uh, were bigger and richer. And there is a symmetry enhancement um, where the four translations are actually enhanced to an infinite amount to what people have been called super translations. So this parameter T is just an arbitrary function of the angle, which enters in this component of an asymptotic killing vector fields. So if I act with this vector field on this metric, I would transform uh, these, these things in blue and red here. But what I will do is uh, I will preserve these expansions. So I will preserve the powers in R in this expansion. So this is what is called an asymptotic symmetries. And uh, these sort of vector fields uh, include an infinite amount of super translation spanned by this function here that I call T, an arbitrary function of the angle. That's why there is an infinite amount. And uh, people have been also realizing by, that by relaxing the bondi mesner zacks and Zs, one can also allow for an enhancement of the global group to the local uh, transformations, where now instead of having six boosts, uh, three boosts and three rotations, I have an infinite amount of so-called super rotations spined by this conformal killing vector field Y. Uh, so this, you have basically a, a holomorphic and anti-holomorphic piece, and they span um, a Virazo algebra if you want, without central extension, namely a wheat algebra. And this was a way more recent proposal to allow for that because there are some, actually allowing for super rotation violates this kind of fall of expansion at some um, isolated point on the celestial sphere. Um, but 
it's it's a very natural thing to do in C, in, in CFT. And now we are we know how to deal with this sort of singularity, what they mean physically, and how to how to treat that. So there is another way of phrasing these uh, BMS symmetries as actually um, the, the they are exactly the same as the conform symmetry of, of a so-called Carlian structure at null infinity. What is the Carlian structure? What is the structure uh, from which that, that is that is endowing any sort of null hypersurface? So basically, a Carlian structure is, is defined by these two ingredients. You have to have a degenerate metric, QAB, and a vector field N, which lies inside the kernel of this degenerate metric. So for the, the, the null hypersurface we're interested in, uh, this is just the form of the degenerate metric. And well, now I'm working on the plane. And, and the vector field is just d by du, where I recall that u is the retarded time which is running along um, the boundary of flat space time. So um, if you look at the so-called uh, conformal uh, Carolin symmetries, which, which, um, which satisfy this equation, you, you find that the vector field which, um, which satisfy this equation is given by this expression. And if you are not familiar with BMS symmetries, well, basically this is exactly the restriction of the of a BMS vector field at, at null infinity, where you recognize these super translations and here these super rotations spanned by y and y bar. So why why do I put Alice in the first uh, picture, and why does why people call it Carlian? Well, basically uh, the a Carlian um, limit was uh, first looked at by um, Jean-Marc Lévy-Leblon in the 60s. And this is really the, the dual limit, if you want, uh, of a, a so-called Galilean limit. So if you have some, some light construction here and you take the speed of light go to infinity, you end up with a, um, with a, with a Galilean uh, space-time where time is absolute. That's what we are used to in Galilean spacetime. Um, while uh, space intervals are arbitrary, if you take the opposite limit, namely you take the speed of light goes to zero, you see that the light cone will close up along this axis, which means that in a Carolian spacetime, uh, space is absolute, is really the opposite, while time intervals are totally arbitrary. This means that uh, two uh, observers in a Carolian spacetime are totally acausally related. There is no causal uh, event that can relate them. And this led Levi Leblanc to call this uh, spacetime Carolian, like very much what happened to Alice when she is um, living her adventures, as it seems that, for instance, in this in this chapter of the Mad Tea Party, the 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 different uh, per, uh, characters are not are related by any causal causal way. So this is why why people now have been uh, talking a lot about Carolian space times, Carolian symmetry, and so on and so forth. But basically, what I want to tell you is that uh, the conformal symmetry of this of this structure are nothing but is actually isomorphic as uh, Duval, Gibbons, and Overty show to the to the BMS bondi messner symmetries. Is there any question uh, so far? <clears throat> OK. Good. So, so something that will be important in this talk are the so-called uh, BMS charges. So the charge is associated to, to asymptotic symmetries are, well, basically, they have been many body of literature which have slowly built up on what uh, what is the right prescription for this charge. So, so this is a very sort of um, subtle story because there are some kind of ambiguity of how to construct these charges. 
But now I think this is the most up-to-date definition. So this is, if you want, this QXA is just another charge associated to the symmetries that I presented before. So the super translation symmetry T and the super rotations. So as you see that is basically here, it's an, an integral at the constant new cut of scry. So it's just an integral of the, over the sphere. And you see that there is a pairing between, between the symmetry parameter T and Y and the gravitational solution space here, the bondy mass aspect and here the angular momentum aspect shifted by, you see all this bunch of terms. So this is are the subtleties that I was talking about. But very importantly, this uh, prescription for the charge satisfy um, a bunch of very nice properties that I will not talk about, but uh, this is a very good prescription for BMS charges. And this is the one uh, I, will, I will follow. Now, very importantly, and this is what all the difficulty comes, across, uh, comes about somehow, uh, these BMS charges are not conserved uh, because there is precisely outgoing flux of radiation encoded in this quantity. You remember this new stensor I showed in the beginning. This new stensor encodes the radiation. And so uh, there is no conservation of this charge, but in instead, the conservation, or if you want, the non conservation of these charges are still under control through uh, this so called flux balance law which tell you basically how this non-conservation uh, deviates from, um, from uh, d by du equals zero. And um, you can split, basically, you can split these uh, flux into uh, what people have been calling the so-called hard flux, which is basically a quadratic into uh, the new stensor and the shear versus the so-called soft flux, which, as you see here, is, is linear in the gravity solution space. So the, the precise split between these two things is again a subtle story. But basically the main message here I want to convey is that this, these, uh, these charges are non-conserved because of the presence of, of fluxes. Uh, Laura? Yes. Uh, do, do you, why is it called hard and soft? Uh, is this related to matter or not? <laughs> yes. So, it's 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 uh, following these um, these uh, nomenclature that Andy Strominger have been uh, introducing in the sense that basically you, this this for instance this soft uh, flux is related once you do all the all the mapping between the BMS language and the quantum field theory language in terms of creation annihilation operator instead of uh, uh, into to the insertion of a soft, so zero energy, a graviton. Oh, uh, yes. What did you say? I, I said, I see. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, basically, it's not very clear from here, but this is, this is soft flux is related to the, what I will maybe talk about is a, uh, super translation current and these currents is the object that once inserted into the S matrix uh, gives you its equivalence to inserting a soft uh, soft graviton. And uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and all the rest is is hard somehow. It's yeah. If you want, it's it's it corresponds to to the matter matter part. If you want. If you if you would have uh, yes, yeah, matter stress energy tensor um, in this in this piece. Yeah, but at this stage it's very obscure, but it's just a uh, common law in this uh, this language to call it hard and, and soft. Good. Uh, yes. So now let's go to a bit some some sort of a distinction between. Um, this Carolian versus celestial uh, picture. And here I would like to, to insist or to make a parallel between these two things, which I, I think help a little bit to disentangle some, some stuff. So as we say in the, in the Carolian perspective, so we will consider the holographic boundary to be null infinity, codimension one, null hypersurface. So in this first approach, um, 
Cry is seen as a boundary along which there is a time evolution. And you have this flux balance law, which, which uh, encode the fact that uh, the charge are not conserved, but instead uh, satisfy these, uh, these equations. And these equations, you remember the Einstein equation were imposing uh, that the bonding mass aspect and the angular momentum were subject to some equation that they had to satisfy. Now they are seen as time evolution equation. On the other hand, in the celestial perspective, it's, I would say, a totally different, conceptually is, is very different uh, because there you see Scry um, really as a po portion of a Cauchy hypersurface, which is pushed to infinity. And this, this is why this perspective is very well adapted uh, to describe a scattering problem between uh, in, in flat space time. So a scattering pro problem where you have in state defined at the past boundary and out state at the future and see how you evolve from one to the other. This is well adapted uh, for, for this purpose. So subtlety is that now, um, since you are um, talking about Cauchy hypersurface, that these equations are now seen as constraint equation rather than time evolution equation. They are the same equations, but it's just different uh, ways to see them. Okay, let me, this is just for, for the expert who know what I'm talking about. There are some, some issue with the, some different, with the closure of the algebra, there is this so-called uh, Barnish versus Trussard bracket versus uh, standard uh, Lee bracket. So I'm leaving that aside. And so, yes, as I said, these, uh, in this current perspective, uh, we will have to deal with the sort of co-dimension one holography uh, versus a 2D, uh, 4D bulk sort of holography. Uh, Laura, can, can I ask a question? Yes. Yes. Uh, so uh, in this first perspective, because as you are saying, there is some flux that is leaving essentially from uh, Scry plus, would you expect the dual to be some kind of non-unitary non theory? Yes, yes. So I, I actually, in the, um, I would say that even, even in here on the right hand side, there is uh, some hint that of non-unitarity, but, but indeed, um, but indeed, this we will have to deal uh, for sure. So this is something that is is very likely to happen because you have outgoing outgoing stuff. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. All right. So now let me talk a, a little bit about uh, celestial CFT for those who are not familiar with this with this program. Um. So yes, it basically amounts to, to this conjecture that one could uh, get a holographic description of, of the S matrix in for this flat space in terms of a two-dimensional celestial conformal field theory, uh, where the idea is to rewrite all the scattering elements in terms of, well, basically to, to write them in a convenient basis by means of the so-called Mellin transform. So this is a Mellin transform. We'll go, I will go back to that. And these written in this boost eigenstate basis, now the, the scattering elements take naturally by construction will be transforming covariantly under SL2C. And so the conjecture is that um, we will now want to interpret these scattering elements as a totally different object in terms of a two-dimensional uh, correlation function which involves a bunch operator. Each operator correspond to inserting, uh, to creating or annihilating a, a massless particle, which, so each massless particle enters the space-time coming from scry minus. When it comes at a given uh, energy, it cross, crosses uh, the celestial sphere at some point, Z and Z bar. And similarly for outgoing particle, and so each of these massless particles will be associated um, an operator living on, this, on the celestial sphere, curly O, which will be labeled by this quantum number, delta and J. So let me explain to you a little bit more how this comes about. So as I said, the whole core of the celestial holography business is to work in the so-called um, Mellin transform basis where basically what you do is you trade the energy of the particle. So you have a, a massless plane wave 
I'm focusing on massless. They are analogizing for massive states, but let's look at massless uh, scattering. Each plane wave has a null momenta, p mu, which can be parametrized by three quantities, an angel momenta. So you have three, 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 num, three parameters, the energy omega, and a point z at the bar at which, at which it pulses uh, the celestial sphere. So now what we will do is that we will trade this energy omega by doing this Mellin transform. We will trade it for a new object, which is this delta here, which will play the role of the conformal dimension of the operator in a celestial uh, 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 safety. So each operator in celestial safety is then labeled not any longer by, by null momenta, but instead by these three quantities, delta, z, and z bar. <clears throat> And the, the advantage of this is that now this object, by construction, you can see that it um, transforms as a SL2C primary under uh, Lorentz, well, under the action of a Möbius transformation on, on Z and Z bar. This is actually just because the Lorentz group acts like this uh, SL2C action on the sphere angles. So now we are. What we are doing is that we have traded the, you see, we're starting from plane wave packets, which was whose translation invariance was manifest by at the SL2C power was obscure. Now we are, uh, we are dealing with the opposite feature. We have a nice manifest SL2C transformation rule with some weights H and H bar, which are the sum of the, dimension delta and the spin. So here, this is a scalar, but if, if you have a spin in particle, it has a 4D helicity, and the helicity is then just identified with the spin in the CFT, the celestial CFT. So now we have this nice SL2C transformation, but the price to pay, then the translation symmetry will now uh, become obscure. And this is the whole, uh, the whole, uh, uh, magic is performed by this Mellin transform. And in celestial holography, we have uh, very importantly currents. And uh, these currents, the celestial currents, are obtained by uh, taking specific limits, integer limits of this dimension delta. Indeed, before we, we could talk about. Um, say soft particle which had energy zero, but now we will be talking about conformally soft particle in this new basis. So just to tell you a few examples of what, what these currents are for in celestial CFT. Um, so basically we can build a bunch of currents very much like in a 2D usual CFT. For instance, if you look at a spin one, <coughs> spin one uh, primary, uh, with delta equal to one, you can see just by this simple equation that you will have an object will transform like a one comma zero. So it's really a U1 catch the current. And uh, there's a lot of literature behind that, traced back to the realization that Weinberg's of theorems was, were associated to large gauge transformations. But basically what you can show is that if you insert this celestial current into a correlation, uh, into a, an amplitude, now interpreted as some correlation function involving a bunch of operators, you will get uh, the, 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 the wire identity of a U1 catch Moody current. And what people have already now um, understood for quite some time, tracing back to work of Stronger and the infrared triangle, is that this is nothing but um, a way to write very famous or very old uh, Weinberg's of photon theorem, which says that a particle a, a scattering ele elements involving a zero energy photon will factorize um, um, and will be basically given by the amplitude without the soft, the soft photon. So this is the, the celestial encoding of this of Weinberg's of photon theorem by inserting this delta equal one current. Now for gravity, uh, you take j equal two, and now you look at, again, this conformally soft limit when delta is equal to one. 
but not quite. What you will have to do more is to take a descendant, so a Z bar derivative of this of object. So as you can see, if you count the ways of O oh, here, we have a three half, one, one half, but now since I'm taking a Z bar derivative, Sorry, if I take, I had a three half minus a half, and then since I take a z bar derivative, I will land on this object I'll call P, which is three half, one half. It's called a super translation current. And um, the OPE of this uh, current with an operator on the celestial CFT has this very funny uh, looking uh, property that you see is not quite. Um, a current in the sense that is neither holomorphic nor anti-holomorphic, uh, but its effect on the celestial operator is that it shifts the weight h and h bar by half each. And this is a one of the the biggest, if you want, uh, funny feature of celestial a celestial CFT is that it will have to obey uh, by symmetric constraint, because there is actually super translation symmetry, it will have to obey this sort of uh, OPE relationship. And then you can already see that uh, what I told you in the beginning, that the role of this, this translation or super translation were a weird in this CFT language, because it have this effect of shifting your dimension of the operator by, by one, or equivalently h and h bar by half. So that's another current, the super translation current. But now you have a more familiar current. This is why people get excited and thought, OK, this starts to be really looking like a usual CFT2. You have something remarkably that transforms like a stress tensor. So don't want to go into many, many details here. It's actually the so-called shadow transform of a delta equal zero primary. So the, the shadow transform basically uh, if you have a primary of, of a dimension delta, it will return a new primary, but now with a new dimension, two minus delta. So if you shadow a zero, you get something which has a weight two. And indeed, uh, you can show that inserting this, this object in a, in a correlation function or similarly looking at its OPE, uh, will uh, give you uh, really the wired identity of a 2D stress tensor in a conventional uh, CFT. And basically, this is thanks to this enhancement of, um, of uh, Lorentz transformation to the so-called super rotation. The fact that there is this object show that um, these celestial operators are not only SL2C primary, but they're actually Virazor primary because this is just nothing but the definition of what is, it means to be a Virazo primary. And people have been checking that. Uh, so they have been taking, you know, scattering amplitudes and then computing Mellin transform on each external leg. And for instance, einstein yang mills amplitude, you can really compute that. You, can, you have N operators, you take N Mellin transform. This gives you N insertion of celestial operators. And then for, for the extra guy, you take a shadow transform, and then you take the limit delta goes to zero, and you really obtain on the nose this sort of, of form. So this, is, this has been checked uh, for several sort of uh, amplitude. So this is just a summary, just to tell you that uh, the soft sector, so the zero energy uh, particle, which is um, described by uh, the Weinberg of theorems is encoded in celestial holography in terms of inserting these currents. We have a Yuan catch Moody, we have a super translation current, which, which have this weird uh, shifting weights uh, stuff, and we have a stress tensor. So I realize that I'm throwing a lot of uh, information. Uh, if this is the first time you encounter all this, so. Mm. Uh, Laura, can I ask again a question? Okay. So uh, is it known how to get, uh, I mean, generically in CFTs, how to get such types of uh, OPs that have half integer shifts? I mean, if you have twist fields or stuff like that, do you get something like this? Or? Uh, that's a very good uh, remark. Uh, actually, 
it it might be so do you, do you have an example maybe you you know more than me about that i mean do you have some this is this familiar yeah i'm just trying to remember now i have to think a bit more but yeah i don't mm -hmm. have it ready in my mind but i'm just considering generically in the space of safeties whether this is possible but yeah okay Thanks. yeah you know so so what what these these operator does is really so so okay first there is this this thing that um so this del this this conformal line mentioned delta in celestial safety is a priori in this melin transform is just any uh complex arbitrary complex number so if you want each one particle state once each massless one particle state is, is associated to a sort of continuous uh, uh, value of delta, which a priori is complex. And these, the translation are just shifting you in the spectrum by, by an increment of, of one in this, um, in, this, in this spectrum. So the full understand, I want to say, yeah, the, the full, what is the spectrum? Because there is this shadow transform and all that is not is not is not clear so far what we are we have in celestial safety. But but in any any theory one might come up with. So the idea is that you know this relationship indeed provide some sort of powerful constraint on any theory you might want to, to build. Uh, because it will this is just a symmetry uh, constraint, it has to be obeyed by by any of the things. So again, we are uh, aiming towards a sort of CFT, which is not probably not unitary, but again, the Hilbert space is not super well understood. Um, Non-unitary and has, has funny, funny features. All right, so I realized that um, uh, I prepared probably too much material, Charles. So I will. I will. Uh, I'm sorry about that. I will. I will not go over time. Don't worry. Uh, I wanted to tell you about this uh, Goldilocks. What we call Goldilocks mode in this uh, last paper. Probably I, I will not have. Well, I, I'm just. I'm just flashing. Uh, flashing this. So basically, I told you there are these very nice, uh, very nice uh, currents which appears for for these del specific values of delta. But actually, you might know that there are also subleadings of photon and sub subleadings of graviton, and these modes, when delta equal uh, so s is the spin here, so for gravity when delta equal minus one, uh, and for uh, the QED when delta equal um, zero, they actually can be associated to the subleadings of photon theorem. The, the story is more tricky because there is no asymptotic symmetry related to this uh, stuff. But there is a sense in which you can you can make make sense of these modes, and then for those who have heard of, there are also this huge tower of uh, of uh, currents that have been at the core of this W infinity story. If you're if you know what I'm talking about, we can discuss afterwards. But uh, I think this will bring us too far. Good. So so this is celestial uh, CFT. Now let, let me try to argue that there is another way to look at the problem in terms of this uh, so-called conformal Carolin theory, but now that we'll have to deal with these sources. So again, so I don't repeat here, I want to show that this, I want to a bit flesh uh, out this, this perspective and show you how these are related to each other. Okay, so now we will, uh, we can forget everything we said so far and, and just uh, look from scratch as um, at a uh, bunch of, of what I would call well some field which have a, a global symmetry. Uh, here, these are the characteristic of the symmetry and which are associated to uh, another current, JK. So this is just a general setup. But now in the presence of external source, which I will denote sigma, these nutter currents uh, will no longer be conserved because you have some a presence of a local flux which violates this conservation of nutter currents. And uh, what we derive first is, uh, is uh, if you want uh, a modification of the usual wired identity associated to 
uh, to currents, where now you have uh, non-conservation of these currents. So usually here you have you have zero on the right hand side. So this is this. If if you have zero on the right hand side, you recognize the just the Francesco sort of uh, wired identity associated to um, another current. So this X denotes a bunch of collection of n and n fields, and uh, and this variation here is just defined like that. So this is the if the left hand side is zero, this is just the usual wired identity. But now uh, we have this presence of this right hand side with this FK here. And so I would like to uh, define um, what I will call now a, a conformal Carolian quasi primary fields of some weights, which transform like so. So this is this is um, the transformation law, which is very familiar for those who know BMS, the how BMS transformation acts act on the field. And this I'm introducing. So you remember, these are the super translation here. You have super rotations. And this K will denote the weights of the Carolian field phi. OK. Now, uh, what you can do uh, is to uh, basically package the network currents, which are associated to these conformal current symmetries, which are recalled take this form, just the usual BMS restriction as cry. You can package this current in terms of this quantity, which, and this is something uh, Charles basically introduced in his uh, work uh, with the team of Paris, which are the so-called Carlian momenta. So the, the, so the CAB here uh, is just, if you want, a repackaging of, of the Nutter current in two different uh, components, which uh, are, are, are called the Carolian momenta. And basically, by imposing the global, so usually in CFT, you know, we impose some the global, uh, global invariance here is the same story, but now for conformal current symmetry for, for this kind of symmetries. So the global symmetry include the Carolian translation, Carolian rotation, boost and dilations. And by just imposing these global symmetry constraint, you already find that there are some uh, constraint on this Carolian momenta, uh, which, which, which take this form. So basically what we're doing here is that we are um, basically redoing all these analysis that we find in DeFrancesco, but now with different symmetry, which is these Carolian symmetries. <clears throat> and now I show you before, so I'm just flashing a lot of stuff here, but the, the main message I want to say is that we had this sourced wide identity, which includes the fact that the not are no longer conserved. And now you can specify this for conformal current field theory, namely for these, these uh, not are currents here you uh, rewrite this in terms of the Carolian momenta, which again are nothing but the different components of this, of this J. So if you specify this very generic equation for a, a, a theory that has this symmetry, you find this bunch of complicated equations, but that you can uh, totally write down. Okay, so this is just very generic. It's just some wired identity or some uh, so some theory which has some symmetries. So so far I didn't talk about gravity, and but now uh, what we had to do in this work, if we wanted to 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 make the map with uh, with the gravity solution space, is to identify this what were these momenta of this Carolian field theory how they were related to the gravitational solution space, namely to this mass aspect, angular momentum aspect, the shear, and so on and so forth. And this is the uh, identification we propose, which is very much reminiscent to, you know, basically uh, these uh, momenta are the, uh, the, the flat analog of the object that build up the holographic stress energy tensor in ADS-CFT. And in the DCFT, indeed, what you do is that you identify the stress tensor with some subleading order in the metric belt expansion. Here, we are doing something similar. We're identifying these Carolian momenta, which are the components of an ultra relativistic, um, so C goes to zero uh, 
stress tensor with the, the, the metric expansion around flat space. And now uh, the role of the sources, the role, the, the thing that makes all the story complicated and all the charge non-conserved and the quantum field theory to have, um, to have this uh, breaking will be played by uh, the news, the news tensor. So this is the source of the theory. We identify it with uh, this uh, news tensor, which capture a recalled outgoing gravitational radiation. So there is a precise uh, prescription, if you want, for what, what these fluxes are, what is the precise form of this flux. Uh, and basically, one thing you can check, for instance, is that if you take these expression and put them in the sourced word identity of the conformal covalent theory, then you can reproduce the equation, the time evolution equation uh, that, that we had in the very beginning. So how the mass aspect and the angular momentum aspect evolve in time. So this is, if you want, the consistency with this uh, Einstein bulk equation that gives us some prescription of what the flux of the, of, the, of the theory should be. And this is, again, the identification between the sources and the gravitational data. Okay, so let me maybe skip these uh, two things, uh, this, this gluing thing, uh, because I'm running out of time. Let me, let me just try to explain how uh, these two pictures can be reconciliated. So the celestial versus the Carlian thing. So uh, sometimes I told you that, that there are uh, these uh, celestial wired identity by where you had this insertion of this current, which was a three half a half. If you remember, it obeyed this, um, this uh, wide identity. When you have this shift of the, of the dimension, here I, uh, it was the H was shifted by halves, which namely delta is shifted by one. And we had this very nice object, which uh, was a stress tensor in celestial CFT. And these are nothing but the leading and subleading subgraviton theorems as shown in this body of literature. So now you have, so in celestial holography, things are labeled by delta. Uh, and we know that um, uh, the momentum basis is related to the Imelian transform. And the position space and the momentum space are related simply by a Imelian transform, uh, sorry, by a Fourier transform. So basically, if you take a composition of a Fourier transform and a Mellin transform, you can directly go from a basis expressed in terms of quantity which depend on the retarded time u. A Fourier transform will express this for you in terms of an energy. And then the, the Mellin transform will uh, map the energy basis to the boost basis uh, delta. So if you take this, this composition, you just get this sort of integral. And this is basically the integral that maps the celestial operators to the Carolian Ka uh, objects. And so this is the precise relation. So on the cel in celestial holography, we have this curly O with the, the delta and the spin. They also depend on the points that and Z bar on the celestial sphere. And on the right-hand side, we had this conformal Carolian primary fields, which we, which live on the boundary at Scry, so they depend on new z and z bar, and they have some weights k and k bar. And you can go from one to the other. You could also invert this integral, so there are subtleties about where this integral converge and which kind of fall off in you you have to, to introduce and so on. But basically, this is the magic. Uh, this, this is played by this integral, very simple. And this is how the weights of the Kaolian uh, field are related to the spin uh, of, of the operator in the celestial CFT. And by using these, this map, um, you can do a bunch of non-trivial checks. So 
basically what you can do is that you can write uh, you remember I showed you these world identities of, of this conformal kernel and field theory with sources which were a bit messy. You can use this map and show that you reproduce exactly these sort of world identities. So the world identity in the celestial CFT, which involved this uh, super translation current and the stress tensor. So of course you will have to insert objects of different dimension and so on and so forth. But basically you can show that these two uh, ways of formulating the war identities can be mapped to each, uh, to each other. So I feel I, I've been a bit fast on a lot of stuff. So let me, uh, let me stop here uh, and try to give you some, some kind of overview of, of, of the talk. So, we have in the bulk 4D gravity in flat space time. And what I wanted to argue is that basically there are two natural uh, holographic proposals for that. One in terms of a 2D uh, celestial conformal field theory, where each particle is labeled by an operator, which inserts inserted on the celestial sphere, which has a dimension delta and j. So these are basically Mellin transform of plane waves which enjoy manifest SL2C invariance. And this is what a lot of people in recent years have been looking at. There's a whole body of literature in celestial amplitude and so on and so forth. And it's very promising. But there is an, uh, another a way uh, to, towards the same problem, which is to look at a complicated theory coupled with sources on null infinity directly. So it's a more, more of a co-dimension one CFT like um, proposal. And in this case, you have a, a field theory which enjoys the conformal Carolian, namely the BMS symmetries. It, it lives in 3D. You have fields uh, defined on this bond, middle boundary. And I, I think that these two are complementary point of views there is a way to map these, these two things. And um, the hope is that uh, basically there are things that are more manifest in one uh, approach, one, uh, some other that are more obscured. But I believe that basically there is no reason to, to, to basically there are really two, two sort of people, people who, who think, no, everything has to be done in the celestial way, other people know it. Why, why, why they don't understand why the theory is living on the sphere, what happened to the time, uh, what, what, what's going on. So I think now we are starting to understand that these two approaches are not irreconcilable. They just make uh, some, some stuff more manifest, some more obscure. And, uh, and hopefully, you know, the, we, this program is building up and we are trying to accumulate of, a pile of, of symmetry constraint for, for, for the for the, the dual theory. And hopefully at some point we will we'll get a more intrinsic uh, definition of that. So I will stop here. Thanks a lot for listening. Thanks, Lara, for the very nice talk. Um, do we have uh, more questions for her? I do have a question. Um, so the, um, um, so the, this uh, this Carolian tensor that whose conservation reproduces the the constraint equation of gravity. Um, do you, do you know how it is written in terms of uh, the celestial CFT stress tensor and the and the um, I mean I, you must know because you you show that the two equations match. But do you have a precise formula that relates the two? Is it just this this Fourier transform? Oh, sorry, this uh, yeah, this sorry, this Mellin transform with, with respect to the time. Yes, exactly. So it's is this Mellin transform? But you, you see the stress tensor is not whatever O here. Its mm -hmm. uh, definition is really the shadow. <laughs> of the delta equal to zero. So the claim then would be that the celestial stress tensor, I, so I will have to 
to just do on the left and on the right uh, this integral transform, which is this shadow transform. So just integral this z square over z minus w to the four, mm -hmm. and then take delta goes to zero. And these, um, these will map me with a, with a specific object on the right hand side. So basically, I can identify the stress tensor of the celestial CFT as some particular uh, yeah, integral transform of a conformal Carolian field of, of weights, you know, it's, it's a J, so let's say, let's say two. So yeah, I have three, well, Carolian wave three half minus a half, something like that. So in, yeah, so basically, since I know basically all the, the, defi the precise definition of the celestial stress tensor on the left, then I can, I can write yeah. down explicitly uh, where they are in terms of Carolian. And so, 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 such an, uh, so the, the Carolian object, I guess, will be one, will be built, built out of these, uh, these Carolian momenta you, you described as. Yes, exactly, exactly. Okay, okay. Yeah, maybe it would be worth to to write down explicitly uh, explicitly what they are. So yeah, I will be able. With be, but basically, you know, we already know what the what the celestial stress tensor is in terms of the phase gravitational phase space. It's basically, yeah. Actually, I can. It's basically the integral over u of u time n z z. Yeah. Shadow transformed. So and so a cross check, but you have to work. Would be to write down this in terms of the Carolian momenta. I see that that it it works. Yeah. But you can already see that you see. I mean, everything will, will be fine. But yeah, I could. I can map the two uh, the two of things. I can map them individually to the phase space, so to the news and the leading soft operator and sub leading soft operator. And um, and this uh, Carolian stress tensor um, does does it have a notion of uh, um, tracelessness like like in the in the relativistic case? It, it, you know, it, like yeah, a, a, conf, a conformal stress tensor is traceless. Uh, uh, is is it? Do you have some? This should have a, an, an equivalent in that space, I guess. Uh, yes, yes, I see what you mean. On this, on this side, yeah, this, this, this would be, you see, it would be a weird, um, yeah, I don't know what it would mean. You see a Carlian, but no, stress answer. Well, no, precisely, it's this ultra relativistic thing that you, you, you have built up. Um, because you see, it's, it's this non local, or is this it's always non local? It's always like this integral over all scry. Um, I mean, it, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I mean, it, it has maybe it's, it's related to one of these uh, uh, wild identity that does not involve derivatives, or I, I don't know, because it could. Um, I guess by construction, it should satisfy. By construction, uh, the one of the sourced, you know, the Carolian sourced uh, world identity should correspond to uh, the fact that if you do a conformal, a vile transformation of the geometry, mm -hmm. it, should, it should not affect, or at least affect just because of the source, the, um, the conservation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, so it, it looks to me that like it should be built in, and I think, uh, yeah, in one yeah. of these, I think you, you wrote at some point some uh, sourced Carolian world identities. Yes. So, how much details did I put on that? <sighs> oh, yeah, here, here, down. Yeah. Yeah, oh, okay. So, yeah, maybe it's these three last ones. The, mm -hmm. This should be the equivalent of the tracelessness. Yeah, I guess. Uh, 
these things, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, think, I think this this should yeah. be. Really yeah. Good. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're right. Okay. And you had this notion of gluing things, sky plus and sky minus, but that's yeah, I skipped that because I was running, I was talking too much. But um, yeah, basically, because you there is this thing that were puzzling us, like you know, there is in principle. In celestial holography, you have this, uh, this idea that you don't have two celestial spheres, one in the future, one in the past, but that the antipodal, you know, and yes, famous antipodal matching condition is basically uh, gluing the two spheres together so that a massless free particle enters and exists the celestial sphere at the same point. And here we were facing this uh, question, namely, we, we don't want to have a Carolian theory here on the future and one on the past, but indeed to uh, glue these two things together. So, I mean, we have a more precise way to explain how we do that. Um, but basically we, are, we have to uh, demand, so basically what the antipodal matching condition is, is imposing is a sort of um, smoothness condition on the Carolian vector field when you go through I0, so spatial infinity. So these allow us to basically um, define the, the theory on just one null boundary, which is here, should be tilted at 45 degrees. Um, and the, the basically there is a preferred separating surface here which you can see geometrically is where the Carolian vector field is zero. Uh, and then you can uh, smoothly interpolate basically a Carolian vector field at the future and the past. And you can see that this is actually some stuff that geometers do all the time and is consistent with, uh, with this antipodal matching. So this allows us to have really only one, uh, one boundary, if you want, not two disconnected pieces, as it should be, I mean. Otherwise, there is no. So now you, your field lives on this whole cylinder. Yeah, that's the idea. Is that um, so? Yeah, exactly. And this this separating surface here is uh, the place where this vector field uh, is zero. And basically, yes, you have a smoothness. So basically, the antipodal matching that people may have heard of between square plus the past of square plus and the future of square minus. Uh, is translated into a smoothness condition through spatial infinity. And this is also, you know, consistent with this recent work done uh, at, at spatial infinity where uh, they have an antipodal matching built, built in somehow at around uh, I0. Yeah. Okay, so now Any other questions? Okay, let's thank Laura one more time. Thank you, everybody. I will stop this screen. <laughs>